thanks everyone for joining us. We are going to get going now because we have a lot to cover. So uh, welcome to our third Lunch and Learn for 2023. Everyone is muted as you join the webinar, but when we open it up for questions and answers, we can unmute you. Uh, I'll, there's also a question and answer function and chat tab at the bottom of your screen that you can use. I'll keep an eye on. So you can enter your questions as they come up. That'd be great. This session is being recorded and the link to the recording and the slide presentation will be provided to everyone who registered after the fact and any NEBRA members who are unable to attend. So thanks for joining us today to learn about hydrothermal carbonization for biosolids. I first met Suzanne Fagan, uh, our presenter today, after she submitted an abstract for the 2022 Northeast Residuals and Biosolids Conference. And the abstract didn't get accepted, but we invited her to be part of our inaugural Shark Tank event. And the technology she's going to talk about, Sea Green's OxyPower Hydrothermal Carbonization, I think has a lot of promise for biosolids. And at the very least, it provides significant volume reduction. And that's something I think we should all be interested in. So uh, Suzanne is a senior project manager and commercial commercialization lead with Next Rung Technologies. She has a BS in engineering from the University of Alabama at Birmingham and is a registered professional engineer. She's worked in several industries over the course of her career, and she is an enthusiastic newcomer to our wastewater treatment business. Uh, Suzanne and Next Rung, Rung Technologies have been working with Seagreen to commercialize this technology in the U.S. So let's get to it and hear all about it. Suzanne, if you want to go ahead and take share over, uh, yeah, okay. share your screen. Okay. Give me just a second. Okay. Here we go. Okay. It's All right. Thank you, Janine. Um, so today I'm really excited to share with you about Seagreen. Um, Seagreen is a Swedish clean tech company located near Stockholm with a mission and a vision to be the global leader in sustainable biosolids handling solutions while contributing to a climate neutral and a circular economy. First, I want to say that we and Seagreen are grateful for the opportunity to share this technology with the NEBRA group. We're hoping that we can generate enthusiasm and interest in what we believe to be a very cool, sustainable, greenhouse gas friendly, circular economy solution to managing biosolids. For a quick preview of the agenda, I'm going to begin with a brief overview of Seagreen's relationship with Nextrung technology for the US i.e. why am I here presenting, representing Seagreen? And then I'll transition into a process overview. I'll give you some details on current installations and I'll wrap up by reviewing some of the distinct advantages offered by Seagreen as compared to, to other thermal technologies. And then we'll open it up for Q&A at the end. So a quick glance at Seagreen. Um, Seagreen was founded in 2015. Uh, the headquarters are located near Stockholm in Sweden. Seagreen uh, is partnered with Nextrung Technology to commercialize the technology in the U.S. Um, and we've been working with Seagreen for about two years. Seagreen um, currently has a team of about 35 people. And in addition to the headquarters in Sweden, they also have a service center, um, a full scale and a full scale operating and demonstration plant. And then uh, last summer, they opened a second sales office in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And then who is Next Rung Technology? Um, so we're a small company. Um, a, a group of engineers um, providing pro project execution and consulting services to organizations that are developing and delivering new sustainable technologies. A brief overview of our services is provided here. Um, in addition to the program management that we're doing for Seagreen, we also offer a broad scope of services such as uh, strategic planning, technology development, project development, equipment sourcing and project execution. 
Generally, I just tell people that we help new sustainable technologies with scale up and commercialization. We're based out of Greentown Labs in Somerville near Boston. Greentown Labs is North America's largest climate tech incubator. I also wanted to add that when we get to the question and answer session, I'll be joined by one of my colleagues, Leah Stallman. Um, Leah has a strong background in water technologies. And now um, I'm going to turn to the technology and I'm going to start out sort of at a high level and then work my way down to the details. So Sea Green's technology is based on a unique combination of hydrothermal carbonization or HTC and wet oxidation that can convert large amounts of wet organic waste or biomass into a dry hydrochar. On a marketing note, the trade Mark name of the technology is OxyPower HTC. Um, you'll notice that I use the term sea green or sea green technology or HTC. Uh, all of these I use interchangeably to refer to the same technology. I just wanted to be sure that that, that was uh, clear. Um, so the OxyPower HTC process significantly reduces the volume of wet waste of the feedstock by approximately 80%. Uh, for the example shown here, the wet feedstock with a dry solids content of somewhere between 15 to 30 percent is reduced to a dry hydrochar with a total solids content somewhere in the neighborhood of 55 to 70 percent. So to give you an overview of OxyPower HTC, these images are from Sea Green's first full-scale commercial plant located at the Stora Enzo paper mill in Finland. This installation has been operating since the fall of 2021, and it has the capacity to handle all of the pulp and paper mill sludge and the municipal sludge from the nearby town of Heinola. The hydrochar produced here is burned as a biofuel in the paper mill's biomass boiler. Um, a standard full-scale unit is nominally 25,000 wet tons per year or 5,000 tons per year dry solid. Um, and Sea Green uses the quantity of dry solids as the basis for sizing a unit. The technology facilitates recovery of nutrients. Um, carbon is converted to hydrochar and biogas, and biogas production can be boosted by as much as five to 10%. The process reduces greenhouse gas emissions, so it effectively stops decomposition of the sludge, so it's no longer a greenhouse gas emitter, but now it becomes a greenhouse gas sink. And just for reference purposes, a full-scale unit could allow a city of 300,000 people to reduce its net greenhouse gas emissions by a ballpark of around 5,000 tons per year. That's equal to roughly 1,000 cars driven for one year. With respect to the, the equipment, the hardware, um, a Sea Green facility is delivered to the site as a set of pre-manufactured container size modules, making it easy to deploy. And it has a relatively compact footprint it's about the size of two basketball courts side by side, including the unit and then its peripheral equipment. Um, the overall footprint dimensions are um, roughly 100 by 160 feet. And that includes the oxygen generating equipment and potential optional nitrogen stripping units. So diving a little further into the process, hydrothermal carbonization or HTC is a thermochemical process, conversion process, and it uses heat to convert the wet biomass into hydrochar. This diagram offers a simplified explanation of the process. Um, the consistency of the feedstock can vary from as low as 12% solids to as high as 30%, and then it would just have to be diluted to be of a pumpable consistency as it's introduced to the process. 
Um, so the feedstock is preheated and then it's fed to the HTC reactor. And in the HTC reactor, it has a residence time of about one hour. That system operates as a continuous process and the HTC reactions result in two phases. So there's an organic rich liquid phase and then a hydrochar slurry. The liquid phase is treated with oxygen to recover um, organics. And um, after wet oxidation, the solution still contains high levels of, of ammonium nitrogen and nitrogen stripping is an option that can be added. So the separated ammonia could be used as a commercial grade ammonia water. So moving from the simple diagram on the previous page to a more realistic view, um, here I have two diagrams of the process. The 3D model gives you a pretty good idea. Well, excuse me, I'm going to back up a little. The image on the left is the plan view, and it corresponds to the 3D model on the right. Um, the 3D model gives you a pretty good view of the equipment arrangement and the piping. The system is set up for counter current heat exchange to recover the heat from the wet oxidized liquid in the HTC slurry. So the center row of vessels in both diagrams represents the feedstock as it's introduced to the system. The feedstock is heated in successive stages as the pressure of the slurry and the liquid streams are concurrently reduced in stages. Seagreen's design uses a direct method of heat exchange in the form of pick style heaters that inject the steam directly into the feedstock and we see this as a real positive as it eliminates the concern of tube fouling or plugging that might be experienced with a shell and tube style heat exchanger. The countercurrent heat exchange also makes the process significantly more energy efficient. And I wanted to talk a little bit about HTC. Um, so this is uh, what is happening in the HTC reactor. The HTC reactions happen quickly. You can see from the yield versus time graph that within the first couple of minutes, the majority of the reactions have occurred and um, the water soluble organic substances in the biosolids have been converted into a less water soluble substance by dehydration and decarboxylation. The resulting substance aggregates into particles and the particles gradually build up to a hydrochar particle slurry in the reactor. And then Seagreen adds wet oxidation. So taking a close look at the wet oxidation step, the organic substances from the aqueous phase are treated with pure oxygen and they're degraded into CO2, water, and organic acids. Seagreen's scope of supply includes a pressure swing adsorption unit that, that provides the pure oxygen for the process. Um, this step, as I mentioned, uh, significantly reduces COD of the solution. Um, check out the two samples here. One is before wet oxidation and the other one is after wet oxidation. So the wet oxidation essentially eliminates about 40 to 70% of the COD and 50% of the nitrogen from the feedstock. The nitri nitrogen can be separated and used as commercial grade ammonia water, like I mentioned earlier. Um, and I'll also go into a few additional details on nitrogen in a few minutes. So let's look at a mass and energy balance for this process. This is a typical mass and energy balance for an undigested wastewater treatment plant biosolid sludge. Beginning on the left, the feed flow prior to dewatering is 100,000 tons per year at 5% solids. I wanna point out that the sludge dewatering and the optional water purification steps shown in purple are not currently part of the sea green process. 
for this example, the dewatered feedstock to the sea green system is 20,000 tons per year at 25% dry solids. Here you see the sludge heating prior to the HTC reactor and then the HTC reactor operating at 200 degrees C and 20 bar. You see the two streams split coming out of the HTC reactor with the aqueous solution feeding to the wet oxidation reactor and treated with pure oxygen. And the heat of the reactions from this step increased the temperature of the solution to 230 C. And this vessel operates at a pressure of 25 bar. In parallel, the hydrochar slurry is cooled and dewatered. The result is 5,640 tons per year of hydrochar with a dry solids content of 65% and an ash content of 26%. Um, the higher heating value is increased from 1,458 BTUs per pound in the wet feedstock to 5,620 BTUs per pound in the hydrochar. The separated water still contains uh, about 200 cubic meters per ton of volatile solids. Um, the two circles with the dashed lines represent the optional ammonia stripping as I described earlier, and then the option of returning the reject liquid to the digester for additional biogas production. So I said I would talk a little more about the nitrogen. Um, a couple of key points here. As you can see, um, the nitrogen is split roughly 50-50 between the hydrochar and the liquid phase. Wet oxidation converts the nitrogen into ammonium and by adding nitrogen stripping, you can recover 40% of that nitrogen in the form of ammonium sulfate. Also, um, if you burn the hydrochar, it will release 50% less NOx to the atmosphere than if you were to just burn or incinerate untreated sewage sludge. Um, if hydrochar were to be burned in a pyrolysis unit, the same NOx reduction would also apply. And here's the finished product. The hydrochar slurry is dewatered to about 55 to 70% dry solids using a plate and frame filter press. Um, the hydrochar ends up with more than 98% of the phosphorus and 40% of the nitrogen from the feedstock. And it's also possible to extract the phosphorus from the ash if the hydrochar is burned. Um, and it may be possible to use a hydrochar for land application, depending on the final characterization. Um, I've seen where land application has been a topic, topic of recent research. Um, it's considered, uh, the hydrochar is considered environmentally friendly as a soil amendment um, for plant growth uh, because it offers a slow release of nutrients. And it's also a form of carbon sequestration. Um, other potential benefits include that it may increase the water holding capacity of the soil, and it also has a positive effect on the soil microbes. So it's important to know that the type of feedstock affects the carbon content in the hydrochar. This chart compares the hydrochar produced from different feedstocks specifically with respect to carbon content. From top to bottom, the list here includes manure, wood, pulp mill sludge, digested food waste, undigested sludge, and lastly, digested sludge. Um, the two key feedstocks to note are the digested and undigested sewage sludges. Um, and as you can see, the hydrochar from the digested sludge has a significantly lower carbon content than from the undigested sludge. And why is the carbon content important? It matters in the consideration of hydrochar as a sustainable commodity and for its potential use or disposition. Um, the list here on the right-hand side of the screen provides a few ideas for potential uses.
And here I have uh, provided a few general characteristics of the hydrochar. The first five, if you're working clockwise, of so dry, sterile, odor-free, stable, and storable are characteristics that might be desirable if you were planning to store the hydrochar. Um, another important benefit is the fact that it has been converted into a form that is no longer giving off greenhouse gas emissions. The two shown in the middle, high carbon content and energy carrier, um, these are characteristics that make hydrochar a good biofuel. And then continuing around the ability to recover nitrogen and phosphorus, phosphorus make hydrochar a good method for recovering important nutrients. And what about helping with the high cost of transportation? Conversion of biosolids into hydrochar has the potential to considerably reduce the disposal transportation cost. Um, the significant volume and weight reduction can save money on hauling of the waste, so it would cost much less to truck it off-site, whether it's being sent to a landfill or whether it's hauled away for another end use. And now to discuss the 800 pound gorilla in the room. Um, and this topic always comes up in discussions that we have with people about sea green, uh, PFAS. So the current published data on hydrochar produced by HTC indicates a two third reduction in PFAs and complete removal of PFOA. This table is from testing and research by Claudia von, von Iser in 2016, and it indicates uh, the results for 10 perfluoro substances that were tested for. Um, so I wanted to note that we're in the process of establishing a lab in the US at the University of South Carolina, and we hope to begin our own PFAS testing on US biosolid bio samples later this year. Um, PFAS is not as significant of an issue in Europe. So um, we felt like it would be good to do the research and testing here. Um, other thoughts, sea green technology could be used as an energy efficient drying step for feeding to a pyrolysis or gasification technology. And there's also the chance that perhaps we'll end up with regional pyrolysis or gasification centers and uh, the significant weight and volume reduction provided by sea green could help make the trucking of that product um, to a remote or regional site um, much less costly. And then lastly, it's important to note that there's no combustion with the sea green process, so air emissions are not a concern. And I wanted to share a few pictures from sea green's installation in Finland. Um, the first photo on the upper left here shows a front end loader feeding sludge into the feed bin. Um, the plant could also be built with a hard piped feed to the process. And then on the right hand side, you can see a view of the vessels that are part of the sludge heating train. And then at the bottom is a picture of the unit as it is installed at the site. And then this is a view of the hydrochar dropping from the plate and frame filter press into the hydrochar collection bin at the, at the site. Um, from here, um, the hydrochar is transferred to their boiler and it's burned for steam, burned to produce steam rather. Um, and the reject liquid at this site is recycled to the plant's wastewater system. I uh, also wanted to note that this plant has been operated on municipal wastewater sludge from the town of Hainala. And then this is a view of operational data from the past eight months uh, for the installation at Hainala. Um, the flow here is indicated in tons per hour. Uh, the gap, so this is running from August to current. Um, 
The gap you see there in September was for a maintenance outage. So this maintenance outage would have been their scheduled maintenance after one full year of operation. And this plant has now been operating for more than 18 months. And a little more about installations and projects that are in progress. Um, I've already mentioned the first full-scale unit at Store Enso that we were just looking at. Um, sea Green has also been using this site for demonstration. For example, I think I mentioned in June of 2022, um, they operated the unit on municipal biosolids from the wastewater treatment plant in the local town. And they're also using this unit to work on some process efficiency improvements. Uh, for example, they've been testing some methods to further increase the dryness and the density of the hydrochar, um, essentially by developing methods to recover heat from the reject water and then using that heat for further drying. Um, they've also tested various methods of granulation or pelletizing for clients that are looking for a pelletized project. And then um, moving here to the center, Sea Green is doing pilot testing with a company called Rime in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Um, this is with their one ton per day pilot unit. And that's uh, that testing is being used as part of their development and design for a full scale plant. Uh, the pilot unit was shipped to the site last week and it's being set up um, for nine weeks of trials that will begin next week. Um, and then on the right here, I also wanted to mention a new full scale installation that is currently in fabrication uh, and planned for delivery in late 2023 in Sweden. And this is for a company called Ryan Cells. Um, Ryan Cells is Sweden, Sweden's largest biosolids waste handler. Um, I'll take a, a little bit deeper dive into the details of the trials in the Netherlands and the installation at Ryan Cells on the next couple of slides. So um, this slide gives a good overview of the concepts that are being tested in the Netherlands with Ryan. Um, Sea Green has traditionally been considered a technology that would be installed after dewatering, essentially using dewatered cake as the feedstock. In this diagram, the light blue box labeled sludge disposal to the right of bubble one represents the normal place to install the Sea Green technology. As an alternative, Sea Green has been looking at integrating the system further upstream in the wastewater treatment process. Um, they're thinking about essentially replacing all of the processes that are enclosed in the light green square so that they would eliminate thickening, anaerobic digestion, and dewatering. Um, the testing at this site will include trials using primary sludge and waste activated sludge as feedstocks, and then comparing the results from those trials with a trial using um, anaerobically digested sludge. And they expect to have the results and conclusions from those tests toward the end of Q3 of this year. And then the project for Ryan Cells, um, this is a full scale installation that's planned for late 2023. Um, and this installation will demonstrate an alternative circular solution that will enable the recovery of nutrients from the biosolids that are not suitable for direct land application. So right now in Sweden, about one third of the sewage sludge is used for land application for purposes of nutrient recovery. And that would be represented by the yellow portion of this graphic. Um, to recover the phosphorus from the remaining two thirds, they're currently using incineration. And of course that's not such a popular choice. Um, so looking for other alternatives um, for the installation at this site, Sea Green will convert the biosolids into hydrochar and then the hydrochar will be burned as a biofuel. 
and then um, Ryan Cells will use their own technology. It's called Ash2Foss, and uh, they will use that technology to extract the phosphorus and other substances from the ash. Um, the Seagreen technology will also enable the recovery of nitrogen from the biosolids, as we mentioned earlier, the 50% nitrogen recovery, and it will reduce the site's uh, NOx emissions. Um, so through this, Ryan Sells believes that they'll be able to guarantee the recovery of phosphorus, even for biosolids that are not suitable for land application. Um, and they plan to include this going forward as part of their standard offerings for wastewater treatment plants. So um, Seagreen currently has three designs that can be used for piloting or testing. Um, the first is the lab scale testing, and that's currently available in Sweden. Um, I mentioned earlier, we're working on setting up a lab at the University of South Carolina. So we hope to be able to take customer sludges uh, it's later this year, toward the middle of the year. Um, and then the pilot unit will be stationed in the Netherlands for about the next nine to 10 weeks. And uh, after that, it may be available for testing in the US if the opportunity arises. Um, the feed rate for the pilot plant is 450 to 900 pounds. They call it their one ton per day unit, but um, it can take that range of, of feed. Um, and then here, the last to the right, um, trials and testing can also be performed at the Hainala site. Uh, that would be a little difficult to test anything from the U.S. there, but um, they can test uh, European biosolids from different sources at that site currently. So we've talked about a lot. Um, I wanted to summarize a few things, um, talk about some advantages that we feel are unique to sea grain. Um, so uh, the wet oxidation, you know, I, I wanted to go back and, and review the fact that there's no need for external heat, but I did want to point out that the system includes a startup steam boiler. Um, also, the COD is further reduced in the reject liquid, um, and then there's an option available for nitrogen stripping if the site needs the reject water to be more pure. Um, the advantages over pyrolysis or other high temperature processes, uh, the HTC process um, could serve as a drying step prior to pyrolysis, um, and then the sea green technology doesn't have the issue of particulate emissions, and the process eliminates 50% of the NOx from the biosolids. And then a couple of other things, there's the potential of eliminating some of the traditional dewatering steps um, that I showed that will be tested at the RIME site. Um, and then there's the opportunity to recover nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus. And then there's the benefit of increased biogas production from the return water. So summarizing, it's a really cool technology. Um, it provides significant volume and mass reduction. You get efficient drying and a hydrochar byproduct that can be used for a lot of uh, eco-friendly things, or it can be used as a feedstock for pyrolysis or gasification. Uh, I shared with you that we have an available lab, a pilot and full scale option. And um, we would love to review uh, or talk with you the potential for uh, using this technology on your specific application. Uh, we're open to testing and creative collaboration. And uh, at this point, I guess we would open it up for questions. Yes, thank you, Suzanne. Uh, I'm going to also pull in your colleague here, um, but thanks for taking us on that awesome tour and diving right into the process there. All right, let me get Leah. I'm going to promote her. I think I can do that. Promote to panelist. Um, 
And yeah, we'll welcome any questions you guys have. You can also, there's a raise hand option down at the bottom. If you want to raise your hand, I can unmute you and you can ask your questions directly. Okay, I think we have somebody with a hand raised. Uh, Ed, all right. This is Professor Wazer from the University of Connecticut Engineering Department to ask a question. Go ahead, Ed. Hi, Suzanne. Thank you. I, I, I'm, I just got promoted to uh, professor. I'm not a professor, but yeah. So I just had a question about the um, the PFAS. It, it it shows that this, there's a reduction in the biochar, but is it is it actually just in the liquid? Form or the liquid stream because I don't think the process is hot enough to, to actually destroy it, right? Right. Um, yeah, and that so Sea Green did some testing. Um, we it was done with a, another party in Sweden, and we did not get those results. Um, the results that I cited here were from someone else's research, just for lack of having other information handy. Um, I would assume that some of it may have ended up in the liquid. Um, and I guess, you know, my other part of that answer would be our intent is to do our own research later this year once we get the lab established here in the U.S. But yes, you're correct. You said that the temperature and the pressure are not sufficient for uh, destroying the PFAS. Right. Yeah. Just, just curious if. It'd be great if there was some something very special about this process that we're able to destroy it. But yeah, um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Un unfortunately, the majority of the processes we're using right now don't address PFAS either. So um, there is a there's a question here also about the dried, the end product. Is that subject to self ignition like pelletized biosolids? That's a great question. That is because it. Yeah. Uh, that's, that is a great question. That has come up before, I think. Um, I would say that that could be a possibility. Um, yeah. All right. It's, 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 it's similar to lignite coal. So, uh, okay. yeah. Well, fair enough. All right. And welcome, Leah. Did you want to add anything maybe that you think? Well, Hi, yes. Thank you so for, uh, for having me on as well. Um, I, I don't have anything to add specific to the self-ignition. Um, that has not, um, that has not uh, come up in, in most of our conversations. But um, as, as uh, Suzanne said, um, you know, it's, it's similar to other um, you know, uh, bio coal based uh, products. I was pretty excited about the nutrient uh, recovery potential. And uh, in, actually, it sounds like you're just thinking overall about all the resources that can be recovered. And also very um, interested in the greenhouse gas emissions yes. reductions that you mentioned. Now, is there a published paper on that or any kind of research on that? Because I would be very interested in that. Mm. I'll have to ask. Some of my our colleagues at Sea Green, they have yes. a, a technology group, and uh, to ask them. And, and I, I have an ulterior motive because you know we do we uh, Nebra does uh, has this project, the biosolids emissions assessment model. Yes. Um, yes. And always looking, you know, if there's some improvements to be made there, and if this is going to be a new process that's going to be used, we might want to look at yeah adding it to so the beam as an option. Interesting you brought that up. So we have um, had contact with Jeremy at SOMAX. And yep. um, I hope it's okay if I, I, Jeremy and I spoke, I think he's had conversations with you about that. Yes. So we did discuss the possibility of uh, maybe even collaborating at some point to have this, I don't know, Seagreen might have some unique things that would need to be considered, but um, yeah. We have so Max is a, another vendor of uh, hydrothermal carbonization right. and you're collaborating with them. Excellent. It's all for the greater good. That's right. 
Any other questions? Again, you can raise your hand. You can pop one in the question or the chat. I am going to grab Suzanne's slides and uh, send out a PDF version of that to everyone who signed up in this recording. So, and I'll give it. I'll give it one more minute. It's Friday. I know the brains aren't working as quickly as they were on Monday. Well, if that, I mean, you did provide a very detailed presentation, Suzanne. So that might be why there's not a heat, whole heck a lot, a lot of questions. But one more, um, oh, a question about the test results on the impacts of heavy metals. Uh, yes, I. If somebody is interested in that, I didn't include it in the presentation, but I do have some data that I can share on that. Yeah, um, if you could give that to me, I'll share it with the follow-up okay. email. Okay. And that's, yeah, that is an important one. That's almost yep. more important than PFAS, if you ask me. But, yep, yep. Um, I've, I've got a slide with some data. I'll add that to the information that I send to you. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks for those questions, folks. Mm -hmm. And um, thanks for your time today and hanging out with us and yeah. having lunch and learning about hydrothermal carbonization. Very interesting. Uh, Thanks uh, for joining us again. And uh, our next Lunch and Learn is scheduled for April 21st. You can learn about how to finance your projects, including piloting new technologies. I'll send out information on that soon. Uh, but we have these lined up through the end of October right now. But if there's something you want to Lunch and Learn about, a technology you're interested in, let me know and I'll try and make that happy, happen. So one more. I think we just have a uh, thank you. Thank you, Suzanne, in the comments here. And yes, thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Leah. And good luck to you. Thank and you. Uh, right. next rung and C green. Yep. And if any questions come up, uh, I think our contact information is in the slides. So we're and I'll and I'll copy you on the email so they can get you directly. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Thank Happy you. Happy Friday. Mm -hmm. Have a great weekend. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.